Hi, and welcome to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Um, my name is Jamie, and I'm here with my co-host, Teresa Kenny, and we're going to be talking about the fertility cycle. Our hope with this um, episode is that we're just giving you a super big picture understanding of what to expect during your um, fertility cycle. So we're going to start off with Teresa. She's going to be walking through um, some of the things we notice starting day one of our period, which is day one of our cycle. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. So we just want to give a basic overview of how the cycle works because we're going to be talking about hormones, these, all of these episodes of the Hormone Genius podcast. And obviously we have to have this foundational education of our cycle. So as women, of course, most women go their whole lives thinking the main event of their cycle is their period. But actually the main event of the cycle is not the period. It's actually something called ovulation. But for the sake of how we talk about the period, we always talk about the period as the first day of the cycle starts with your menstrual flow or the bleeding. And so what's normal for a menstrual cycle um, in terms of like how long it comes, how long the bleeding phase lasts is about four to six days. And of course, everybody's a little bit different. So when we talk about normal, we always remember everybody's got an individual kind of normal to them. Um, but the period basically, again, four to six days. Of course, period is bleeding. We know that that is the shedding of the lining of the uterus. So what's happening at that moment is that that lining that's inside the womb or the, the uterine lining that prepares every month for a potential um, unborn little child to be developed in there, it gets shed off. And that is what we call cycle day one. So the first day of bleeding is cycle day one. And of course, most of the time with a period, you're going to start with either a light flow and it builds up into a heavier flow. So a lot of women will start with light and then they go to medium. Um, maybe they have another medium or a heavy day and they go back down to light. So we call that kind of the crescendo, decrescendo aspect of a menstrual flow. And some women actually just start with straight up heavy flow. So they might not have a light day, they might just have a heavy day right away. But again, it still has this decrescendo aspect to it, going back down to a lighter flow at the end. Again, so the period lasts about four to six days. Well, what's the point of the beginning of the cycle at that moment? Well, when the period stops, what's happening is, is that our brains need to talk to our ovaries. And so it's always important to remember that the primary, what we call sex organ, is basically the brain. And so messages need to be sent to the ovaries in our reproductive system, in our pelvis, to tell those ovaries basically to get an egg and a follicle ready. And so that's what happens at the beginning of the cycle, right at the end of the period, is that the brain is talking to the ovaries and saying, okay, it's time to get a, an egg chosen, a special egg chosen for this cycle, and we're going to get that developing. So on the ovary, about day um, six, seven, eight, nine, that, um, that ovary has now chosen what we call the dominant egg, and it will start to grow in something called a follicle. And a follicle is a fluid-filled cyst that sits right on the ovary, and that follicle is basically going to start producing one of our main ovarian hormones. We have two hormones that are basically the very main ones, and those are estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen is the main hormone that's going to start to get produced when that follicle is growing. And that follicle, again, sits on the ovary and it's going to grow into what we call a mature size in about five to seven days. So here we are, we had our period, then that brain is telling our ovaries, get that egg ready, and our follicle on our ovary starts to grow. And this is what we call um, the pre-ovulatory phase of the cycle. So the body is again preparing for the main event, which is ov ovulation, and it's starting to produce this beautiful hormone called estrogen, and that follicle is getting ready to release that egg. And the release of the egg is what we call ovulation. So that's the whole kind of beginning phase leading up to ovulation. Now, the one main thing we want to make sure everyone understands about that phase of the cycle is that there is a biological marker that tells our bodies when that main event is approaching. So just like the bleeding is a sign, of course, that the lining is being shed and something is happening in our reproductive system, the body has a sign that tells us when ovulation is approaching. And that main sign is cervical mucus. 
So cervical mucus is a discharge that women see. And as those estrogen levels are getting super high in the body, this is where women start to see it. And it usually lasts for about four to even five, maybe six days that they have this beautiful cervical mucus. And that again is all being produced because of the hormone estrogen. And once that hormone estrogen um, is basically at its highest peak, that's when women are noticing the highest amount of cervical mucus, which tells again that she is having that main event, which is ovulation. So I'm gonna hand it to you now, Jamie, to talk about what happens basically in that ovulation kind of event and that transition to the next phase of the cycle. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. This is so exciting to me. I remember in high school, I was so uncomfortable about our feminine body. Like I couldn't say breasts. Like I had to call our breast chestal units. And here we are talking about cervical mucus. It's like my favorite thing ever. Okay. All right. So yes. Yeah, so as Teresa stated, so day one of the period is day one of the cycle. A woman notices around, you know, four to six days of bleeding. Um, and then as her body prepares to release an egg, um, she starts to notice um, again that, well, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there's also a sign of this like we said, cervical mucus, and the cervical mucus is really important for sperm, but we'll talk about that too in a minute. So the woman ovulates, she's reaching this peak estrogen level, and then after the woman ovulates, she will notice that there's a, an extreme shift in what she's noticing when she's using the restroom. So that cervical mucus now turns into hardly anything at all or nothing at all. And so that's a sign that the woman has ovulated, and something that's important too for women to understand is that this is definitely just a snapshot, like a big picture, like understanding, but not enough, not enough information to use the system to avoid or to achieve like effectively, especially to avoid effectively, just so you know. So if you're looking for natural ways to avoid or achieve, this is big picture. Okay, so the woman ovulates um, and then she notices a, a shift. And then what's happening there is there's something in the woman's ovary where actually the follicle becomes the corpus luteum. So the follicle was the cyst-like structure that Teresa was talking about that, house, that houses the egg. And when I was again in high school, I didn't know that there was a follicle. Like I didn't know there was something that housed the egg, but it's true. And that, that follicle becomes the corpus luteum. And just as a, like a Jeopardy little thing, if you ever get asked this question someday, the corpus luteum means yellow body. Just also a little fun fact. So this corpus luteum produces the hormone progesterone. So progesterone um, has two, well many effects, but two that I'm going to talk about. One as a drying effect, again because you're shifting, so this is an infertile sort of observation. Um, and again we're going to talk about this, we're going to kind of wrap around and talk about fertility and infertility and what these biomarkers and how our body changes can help us understand the big picture. Um, but when a woman doesn't have mucus, she's considered infertile for the most part, and we'll talk about that. But then also this progesterone is helping to sustain the uterine lining that the estrogen helps to proliferate or to build back up so that when pregnancy does occur, there's, um, there's a uterine lining for implantation to occur. So um, typically women have a very stable amount of days after ovulation until the day before the next period. So this range of like this ovulation time before the, the you know, at, until the day before the next period is around 12-ish days, that's average. So normal is considered like nine to 15-ish days, but you want it to be very stable. So normally what I think is interesting, Teresa, and I'm sure you see it all the time, is when women are coming in and they're like, my cycles are crazy, they're not the same length every time. But the interesting part about that is actually what we're looking for is stability in the, the, the post-ovulatory time. That helps us understand at least a little bit about her progesterone levels. Um, so again, in the body, the progesterone is keeping the uterine lining nice and thick. And then also this woman is not going to be getting pregnant um, if she has not gotten pregnant already. Um, the egg that was viable for 12 to 24 hours um, in the ovulation time um, is no longer you know, viable for pregnancy after that fertility time. Again, we're gonna kind of circle through and talk about the importance of cervical mucus as well in regards to fertility. But that's what I wanna share about the post-ovulatory time. Um, but now let's talk about like, you know, if people are thinking about using a natural system, 
to avoid or achieve. Teresa, what can you tell our listeners about cervical mucus and their fertility? Yeah, well, and I'm glad you mentioned how kind of we didn't get to know this information in high school because it makes me think of a talk I did just recently for a, a really big group of high school kids. And um, I remember there was a group of girls kind of sitting off to the side together and I was talking about cervical mucus and you could see kind of like, what is she talking about? I don't want to talk about mucus, you know? And then um, after like we got talking um, at the end, they started asking questions and this girl raised her hand and she's like, I never knew what that stuff was. And she's like, I'm just glad to know that I'm not the only one that has it. And then all these girls just like, they almost like just like took a sigh of like relief, like, oh my gosh, you have that too. <laughs> you know, again, I mean, like we don't talk about this stuff when we're young and, and we don't know if it's normal or not normal. And that's, it's so unfortunate because everybody gets like a biology class and you talk about your periods and puberty and things like that, but nobody talks about cervical mucus, which again, it's kind of like the main deal. It's the whole reason why we have periods to begin with. So in terms of fertility, yeah, I mean, what's, you know, we have to remember that women's fertility is just this super short window. And that has been something that a lot of people just, there's a misconception about that women can get pregnant multiple times in a cycle, um, that uh, maybe she ovulates when she's, you know, sexually aroused. There's so many misconceptions around when a woman can actually get pregnant. But like you said, a, an egg that's released from a woman's body, which happens once a cycle, only lives for 12 to 24 hours. So the window of con ability for a conception to occur is really quite small. Mm -hmm. Now, the fertility window is opened up a little bit by this stuff, cervical mucus. Why? I mean, I always say, like, you have to have three things to make a baby. You have to have a quality egg. You have to have a quality sperm, of course, that comes from the man. And you have to have this stuff called cervical mucus. And when I'm talking to high school kids, I'll be like, well, who knows why? Why do we have to have this stuff? Cervical mucus, who, why? You know, and they're like thinking, and I'm like, well, it has to do with the guy more than it does with the girl. And so they kind of put finally two and two together. And it's because sperm have to swim to get to the egg, like swim through the human body and they need water essentially. So this stuff, cervical mucus is basically like 98 to 99% water. And as that window of fertility approaches, again, if you think of just an average 28 to 30 day cycle, um, you know, we have our period and then there's a period when you're not fertile at the end of the period usually, and women will not notice any mucus. She's dry at that time. And then that follicle is growing and this estrogen is being produced and this fertile window opens. And then this um, mucus is starting to flow. We kind of, we call it like a biological valve or a faucet. I mean, I refer to it as a faucet because I say as estrogen goes high, you crank the faucet on. And then as soon as that egg is released, the faucet cranks off. Why does it crank off? Because progesterone now has taken over as the main hormone. So this window of fertility, very short. And it's opened up by this beautiful stuff that women's body makes, women's bodies make called cervical mucus. And that allows for conception to occur at about a range, you know, like again, the egg lives for 24 hours, but because sperm can survive in good quality mucus, it will open up their fertile window for about three to even seven days in a cycle, depending on how much cervical mucus a woman has. Um, but sperm basically can only survive in good mucus for three and at the max five days. Um, so that's where we, you know, as women, we have this gift and power basically to determine each and every day whether we're fertile or infertile. And I know, Jamie, you teach couples how to determine whether they're fertile or infertile and use this as a way to either achieve or avoid pregnancy. So how does that process of learning work for them with learning this incredible aspect of their fertility and their cycle? Great question. Well, so I teach the Creighton method, but there are several systems out there. What I like so much about the system I teach, and again, you know, there's many, there's many systems, um, is that, you know, they, we become, in a sense, the doctors and the medical professionals' hands and feet. We take the time. And so 
um, when women and couples are coming to learn about their cycle, we start just really big picture again, just kind of like what we're doing with you guys here. And we're just giving you like the big picture understanding. And then we kind of zoom in a little bit more during our one-on-one -on -one appointments. Um, but it's very, I love this so much. It's so cool to see how the guy changes. The guys change. I mean, anytime a woman calls and says, hey, I need to make an appointment. Oh, come to this group presentation. That's how we do this with the system I teach. Come, we're doing a group presentation. And then from there, you'll decide if you want to chart and then we'll set up our one-on-one -on -one, on -one appointments. The, the wife always says, or the woman says, well, should I bring my, should I bring my husband? I'm like, yes, <laughs> please, please bring your husband because he's an integral part of this whole process for you because it takes two to tango. You know what I mean? Like your fertility alone, like Teresa said, it's only a, like a window of time. So a man is fertile. If he's a fertile man, he's fertile every single day. Um, but that doesn't matter if it, he's not paired with a woman who is experiencing her fertile window. You know, the woman, for the most part, is infertile, ex except again for this number of days where she's noticing this mucus. And again, to do this effectively, you want to work with somebody because there's a lot more to it to, than just that. So it really takes the two together being fertile for the couple to be fertile. So I'm always like, you got to bring the dude. Because when the guy comes, again, he's kind of weirded out. But then as he participates in our one-on-one -on -one appointments, you really can tell he starts to open up. And while you might think that like cervical mucus is the least, bleh, like, mm -hmm. could they have called it cervical fluid? Like, why the word mucus? Yeah. But that's what we, you know, it's just so funny, Teresa. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because like you would think that the mystery would decrease, you know, like, oh, I don't, you're not as mysterious to me anymore, but that's actually seems to be very opposite of what I find. So not sure if I answered that question for you, but I did want to share how I love it when the guys are involved. So if you, yeah. um, again, yeah, no, my husband's a high school teacher and, um, you know, we practice, uh, natural, uh, family planning and and we have that done that through our whole marriage so he always wanted to teach the kids about it too the high school boys so he teaches it all boys high school um which you know again you've got dudes and they're learning about the woman's body and they're like uh, i'm not really sure i want to hear this so he would he would teach them something called the mucus song and i, I can't even tell you what the mucus song was but i'm sure it was super corny and he would get them used to saying the word mucus basically. <laughs> and then in order to like help them understand like what cervical mucus actually looks like, he would bring in eggs and he would show them egg whites, right? <laughs> because, and you'll see this kind of like Google images sometimes too, when we're talking about fertility and cervical mucus, that egg whites are kind of like the closest human food or whatever that you can say, this is what cervical mucus looks like when it's totally at its very peak. And it, it does, you know, there's total variations of mucus. And in Creighton model, of course, we get really specific about mucus. But um, I know, it's just so cool that women and men can work together as a team, you know, and they can really each and every day, um, a woman is observing her body, but the man is involved in knowing her body and understanding it and they're communicating about it. And then they're deciding, you know, do we, have a baby or do we not have a baby? And that aspect of communication, we always say is super healthy for relationships and marriage um, because, you know, it's, you're talking about the most important things, right? I mean, can, is it the right time to have a baby? Can we afford another baby? All of those things that are super important, like natural kind of understanding fertility um, is allowing communication to occur in relationships. So that's another bonus you could say to just natural methods. Totally. And sometimes too, I want to say like, if the woman just knows her husband is not into this. And so then she might think, well, maybe I can't chart. Well, then that's not the truth either. But if, if you can at all get the guy involved, great. But if not, don't let that keep you from learning about your own body. Um, oh, yeah. Because, you know, it's so fascinating. Once we, once we are introduced to the body that we live in, and again, you would think, you know, even when I was younger, I had no idea. Or even into my 20s, I didn't really understand this body that I lived in. I didn't know what was right, what was healthy, what was anything, you know? And so it's crazy when we introduce women to their body, 
Um, and when we show a woman what a healthy body looks like, um, they it quickly can start to understand, well, this pattern doesn't look like it should. So, wow, bonus, like I can begin to understand what healthy hormones look like and get help for that naturally. And then for those of um, us who are avoiding pregnancy, um, we don't need the birth control pill and we don't need barrier methods. We just simply need to know and understand our cycle. And how freeing is that? You know, we think, oh, maybe the birth control pill or whatever else, oh, contraception is freeing. You know, it's freeing. There's no consequence. It's freedom, but actually it's not. It's very binding. It's very binding. It affects our body, it affects our mood, it affects our traction, it affects so many things. And Teresa and I are gonna be talking more about um, that in future episodes. And I'm really excited because that's something I'm really passionate about. Totally excited to just, yeah, allow women to be better informed to make decisions about this and to understand it all. Because a lot of times we just feel like kind of we're at the mercy of our doctors if, if they just tell us what we should do. Um, really, it's about empowerment, you know, and that's what this podcast is about, really, is empowering women with knowledge so that they can make choices that are um, great for their health and great for their relationships. So hopefully, I mean, that was just, I mean, literally like a snapshot of the fertility cycle. And in some ways, we can't even do it justice, you know, um, y you know, you need diagrams and and to show all the beautiful, like, roller coaster of hormone rides that women go on and the beautiful kind of changes throughout the cycle. But hopefully it's a, enough of a snapshot that it makes you want to learn more. And um, of course, Jamie and I, we want to provide those resources. So we'll continue to kind of um, in our podcast, like write-ups and under our YouTube channel, put um, information about classes that you can take to learn more about fertility charting and to know your body. And, and that's our call to action to you is this is, this is the next step. This is just getting you interested about the beauty of the feminine design and you're gonna wanna take the next step and learn more.